Alors, euh, je vais appeler le prochain, la, la prochaine ministre, qui est le, la ministre l'honorable Patty Haidou, euh, et simplement vous dire que la suite, ensuite, nous allons accueillir le ministre David Lemiti, et ensuite, nous allons accueillir le leader du NPD, Jack Ming Singh. Alors, j'aimerais maintenant appeler l'honorable Patty Haidou à venir me rejoindre sur le podium pour pouvoir s'adresser à vous. Nous allons fonctionner de la même façon. Nous allons mettre le 10 minutes sur le, la minuterie. Nous allons prendre une période de 20 minutes de questions et de réponses au microphone 1, 2 et Zoom. On s'excuse à l'avance et on vous remercie à l'avance parce que ça se peut qu'on n'ait pas le temps de se rendre jusqu'au bout de la liste. Hein. On fait ce qu'on peut selon le temps qu'on a devant nous. Alors, euh, vous pouvez vous lever si vous voulez tout de suite, si jamais vous... <rire> Mais on va prendre les, les questions. Et alors, euh, oui, alors euh, merci beaucoup et on va fonctionner avec trois comme on a fait pour le ministre précédent. Alors, ministre Aïdou, je vous euh, cède maintenant ma place. Merci à vous. Merci beaucoup. Merci de me recevoir aujourd'hui. Je suis très heureuse d'être ici en passant. And it is such a pleasure and a joy to be with you here today on the traditional territory of Coast Salish, Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. I come from Fort, uh, the traditional territory of Fort William First Nation, a signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty area. And, um, I spoke this morning to Ontario Caucus, and it is really like uh, meeting old friends and colleagues. You know, Northern Ontario is a small place, so we've worked together for, for very many years. Now, um, I know that through the many conversations that I've had over the 10 months that I've been the Minister of Indigenous Services, that all of you have been working incredibly hard uh, here as chiefs, as leaders, and as uh, delegates to improve the lives in your own communities for your children, your grandchildren, and, and the members of the, your communities. And I, I want to thank all of you for that hard, relentless work, because I know it takes a personal toll. Um, I've spoken to so many of you that are not only working on community issues, but also challenge, living with challenging circumstances yourselves. And I want you to know I appreciate all of that incredible effort. So for me, as a Minister of Indigenous Services, and some of you I feel like may have heard this, this story before, but when the Prime Minister asked me to be the Minister of Indigenous Services, for me, there was a moment of pause because I understood deeply how colonial this position has been over the past, well, 150 years since the position has been around. And I was really... Um, wanting to make sure that as I accepted this position that I could do it in my own way and do it in a way that would feel like I had integrity because I certainly didn't want to do this job in a way that was about explaining the government to all of you, um, really uh, trying to essentially oversell the good works of the government to all of you, which I'm sure you've all experienced in these meetings and many others, but rather to turn it around and to be your advocate, to be the person that fights for you, that fights for you within the federal government at the cabinet table with the treasury board uh, president, with the minister of finance, with the kinds of people that often um, limit uh, how fast and how quickly we can transform our communities. And so when the Prime Minister said to me, uh, yes, that he expected me to fight for Indigenous people, I was relieved because I knew that I could do this job to the best of my ability to be your advocate in all of those rooms in Ottawa as we try to transform and renew this relationship that has so much promise, but so many broken promises at the same time. You may have heard uh, me speak in earlier meetings also about the determination that I have to transform Indigenous Services Canada. And I want to thank my colleague, Minister Miller, who spoke before me because he certainly worked very hard on this as well while he had this portfolio. And you know, Minister Miller did mention that the department now has a goal of closing the socioeconomic gap by 2030. I smile when I say that because it's an ambitious goal. We're seven years-ish, seven and a half years away from that deadline of 2030. And that means that the investments that we make, the work that the federal government does to be a good partner, a good treaty partner, a good partner, means that it has to be intentional. The department has to have a plan, and it can't be an aspirational goal. There have been too many aspirational goals over the history of our country and colonization of Indigenous people. 
And so I have asked and tasked the department to create a roadmap uh, of how we will get to 2030 and what kinds of investments it will take to ensure that we can indeed close those gaps. I have such a respect for the principles of um, Indigenous people when it comes to planning seven generations ahead and using the lessons of seven generations behind us. And I think that when I have, uh, what I've most impre been impressed about uh, as I've been meeting with people today is the inclusion of young people in these meetings. Many of you have brought young people, have young people at the tables, have young people that are employed in your communities, but on youth councils and leading as elected leaders. And I think that we need to do more of that together. We need to make sure that we're amplifying the voices of youth because they truly are inheriting the mess that we've left them. <laughs> and they truly are going to transform how we work together. And so I wanna thank all of you for bringing the young people with you. The other principles that I have asked the department to work through are uh, honesty and self-determination. And I wanna talk about honesty for a bit because I think it's something that's been missing for a very long time in the conversations that the federal government has had with First Nations people. So many times, and you'll, this may ring true to you, you'll hear that your proposal is at headquarters, that your proposal is under review, that your proposal is stuck somewhere in the bowels of bureaucracy. And oftentimes, um, that could be true, but it could also be that you have a person who's not courageous enough to tell you that the department is out of money in that particular infrastructure envelope, or there isn't a plan forward on how to pay for that project or that the department doesn't have the support um, politically to actually prioritize that project. And I've asked my officials and I've committed my team, my political team, to always be honest with you because I believe that by being honest together, it's actually a form of power. When you have the truth about why it is your particular project or program is not receiving the funding in the time and in the allotment that you think you need, you can do things with that information. You can go to the media, you can look for a new partner, you can decide you're going to find it yourself, or you can walk away from the project and choose another. But you need that information to be able to make those decisions. We need to continue to have those hard conversations. And, that, and, and that's why um, I've asked the department to make sure that you're getting information in the most honest, forthright way. And I can guarantee you, I can promise you that you will get that from me and from my political team. Now, self-determination has to also be a core feature of the department and also a core principle that we are driving forward together on, on ensuring that communities have what they need to make their own decisions in a way that reduces the layers of bureaucracy that control how and what you do in your communities getting out of your way, ensuring we support your drive, and, that we, and ensuring that you have what you need to get to your goals. And it's why co-developed legislation and Indigenous solutions, in my way, mind, are the only way forward. And it is about the young people, the young people that will lead the programs and the services and our communities in the future. People like Renee and Jordan, Angelina, Larissa, Autumn and Savannah, just some of the people I met here to, today at AFN. They're already leading and they're working and they're doing so brilliantly. And so it's that self-determination, the tools that we're creating together, where we're, whether we're talking about co-developed health legislation, co-developed water legislation, co-developed policing legislation, some of the work that we've already done on education, on child welfare, those are the tools that those young people will use increasingly as they transform communities. It's exciting to see some of our work, our hard work, especially here with partners like AFN come to fruition. And I want to congratulate uh, AFN and the Executive Council on the incredible work on the settlement, the CHRT settlement. And, you know, we're not done yet. We've got a lot of work to do on the agreement in principle on transforming care. But to have a final agreement uh, filed with both courts on compensation is a huge accomplishment. And it is uh, the result of dedication and hard conversations. And I want to congratulate everybody involved. 
I'm also excited about the implementation of Bill C-92, and one of the highlights of my first 10 months was being in Wabsamung as uh, customary code was implemented, as the control and care of children and families was turned over to the rightful um, leaders of Wabsamung. This is exciting. It means more families that are intact, children that are kept in communities, and it's an opportunity to change the next generations. There's so much work that we are doing together to transform how communities are supported to have that autonomy they need to make those changes, whether it's on emergency management, whether it's on infrastructure priorities, and excitingly coming up, the water legislation that will ensure that we can move more quickly to protect and maintain clean drinking water in First Nations. I've been given the one minute mark. I have so many more things to talk about, but I'm looking forward to the questions that I see lining up at the mic. And it's an honor to be the Minister of Indigenous Services of Canada and work with all of you. You inspire me every single day. Thank you very much. Do you want to be seated? Sure. I want to take three first questions. Okay, so we are now at the Q&A session. Thank you so much. We will uh, go... Uh, okay, so I will just go at the microphone too, but because it would be unfair. So, for, so microphone number two, please, first speaker, to you. Good afternoon, Minister. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to... I'm here as Chief of Montreal Lake, Chief Joyce of Montreal Lake. And uh, I'd like to introduce um, Councillor Carol Nadeha, who is in charge of uh, health. She's, got, she's holding the portfolio for health, and she's got questions for the minister. Thank you. Thank you. If you can please just make sure to not exceed the two, two minutes per speaker, please. This wait will be fair. We could hear the most. Thank you to you. Good afternoon, everybody. I just want to say thank you to a creator for allowing us to be here today. I thank you for the three First Nations for allowing us to have this meeting on their territory. Um, band Councillor from Montreal Lake Cree Nation, I guess one of the things I want to talk about today is mental health. Um, Montreal Lake Cree Nation is in a mental health crisis. We have uh, many different types of issues um, regarding mental health and it stems from our history of trauma. We've all been talking about it, whether it's day school, residential school, 60 scoop, you know, everything up above, you name it. Um, right now we're in a mental health crisis and we've actually been doing a lot of work and put forward many different types of proposals. We've put in a land-based healing proposal. Um, we have not had any word back from that. We've put in a treatment center proposal we have not had any word back on that. And we've also put in a detox center, medical detox center proposal. So the one thing I wanna do talk about mostly is um, we do have a plan, a comprehensive plan for the mental health of Montreal Lake. And we've been working alongside FSIN David Pratt um, with a mental health plan as well. But it just seems as our mental health plan is not being recognized. It's not being looked at, and I really hope that I can sit down and have more than two minutes to discuss with, with sure. you, because province of, we're told that the province of Saskatchewan is covering the detox. There is no detox center in any First Nations community in the province of Saskatchewan today. I'm getting the cut yeah. here, but there, that needs to be changed. Um, for our community, we need that. Our First Nations people need that. For our province of Saskatchewan, we need that. We need detox centers. We need treatment centers. We need land-based healing camps out there. We need to help our people heal. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just, uh, we will now go to uh, the, the Zoom uh, speakers list. So Kevin Hart, Proxy, you can uh, be unmuted and be, you can put your camera on. Thank you to you. Please, two minutes. Thank you, uh, Minister Hagen, for being there. Um, the question I have for you is that over the last decade, we've had a significant number of uh, weather events in our First Nations. I know that our relatives there in BC have experienced weather events uh, all too often as well. What we've seen with the uh, 
the federal government is that there's always a backlog when we talk about reimbursing these First Nations. We've just uh, are going in post pandemic now. First Nations are still recovering from the pandemic. And we also had a weather event in, in the Manitoba region with uh, extreme flooding again, where uh, First Nations have been displaced. Of course, there's costs associated with that. But this just further puts uh, First Nations uh, behind the back burner because they're struggling to try and be reimbursed from the federal government. And I know this has always been a long-standing uh, issue here. So I'm asking you as the minister to see if there could be dedicated resources in a department to help all the First Nations across this country that are experiencing these weather events, whether it's in regards to climate change or or, or other uh, uh, significant uh, events that are occurring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will take the last, uh, I'm sorry, I just mentioned before that I will go there because they're, 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 they're up since a while. So I'm going to get to you, microphone number two, we'll stay there and, I'll, and after I'll go back with two and one and Zoom. So thank you. Microphone number two, please. Thank you there, Madam Speaker. Brian Hardlot, uh, Prince Albert Grand Council, Grand Chief in Saskatchewan, northern Saskatchewan. A uh, minister, I didn't have an, opp an opportunity, but I, I did speak to a uh, Mark back there. A, uh, in the area of a uh, treaty, the medicine test, Treaty 6, I just want to thank your office and also a, uh, Minister uh, Miller's office uh, for, the, for the grand opening of the uh, Woodland a, uh, Treatment Centre in the Prince Albert Rand Council a, a territory, a, a LaRange, one of our First Nations. Thank you for that. A, a second, a, a, a Chief a, a Joyce uh, Nadeau spoke to Mark Mil Miller, and that's regarding the, uh, again, that, the thing that we've been uh, discussing with you, your office, and also Minister uh, Miller's, is the, uh, the, the um, children's home, Timber Bay, and for it not being recognized as a residential school. Those survivors are uh, waiting on you. They are waiting on us for answers. So I just really want to put that to your attention and we need, we need some kind of a response from the government. Those survivors are waiting for a response. Uh, third, a uh, minister, a, um, again in the uh, area of the um, treaty, Treaty Right to Health is the, uh, in Saskatchewan, where we have our office, the Prince Albert Grand Council, is the uh, Victoria Hospital. Please conclude. And, and a rebuild to the Victoria Hospital. Minister, hey, uh, we need many, that the uh, hospital serves many, many First Nations around the region. And yet, there hasn't been any federal Indian monies for that hospital. We have a partnership with the province, but that partnership doesn't mean anything if there's no funding. Thank you very much. Hmm. Thank you very, very much. So I uh, will now turn the floor over to um, Minister Aydou, and I'll go back with you, Chief McBride, to you. Thank you. I'm not sure, can we open the uh, microphone, please? Is it possible, not sure? Is it possible? Techni okay, so I think we'll just... Is it, is it on? Can you hear me? Oh, it is on. Uh, okay, okay, perfect. It is thank on. you to you. Okay, well, thank, thank, thank you. you very much, Jason. Um, first of all, um, to the community of Montreal Lake and mental health and the crisis of mental health, you're not unique and alone in this, and I know, I know you know that. This is a crisis that's happening across First Nations and indeed across non-Indigenous communities, um, and, and the pandemic has wor worsened it uh, tremendously. As you know, we have um, hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, available money for mental health programs, and um, I'm really thrilled about the work that Jordan's principal has been doing to um, support community-developed and led mental health and wellness programs. 
I will speak with you individually on your own particular proposals and my staff are here to connect with you to make sure that we have a time to talk. It is unacceptable that you're not getting any answers. Um, and when people don't get answers from the department, please reach out to my political office. Um, you know, uh, we'll make sure that that information is available to AFN so that you can connect with our political leaders. And my job is to ask the department why they are not responding um, um, in a timely way to the requests that you've, you have in front of you. Um, I will say that there's no one solution. And I come from a long history of uh, people myself that struggled with substance use and mental health. Uh, each community has its own challenges and its own unique answers and I'm very interested in working on um, those unique programs and services that are uh, designed by communities for community members because I think that is truly the only way through this crisis. But I also think it's going to be our continued focus on the social determinants of health, the housing work that we'll be doing. Um, we'll be announcing very shortly the housing allocations as a result of the investment in Budget 2022, the work that we're doing on infrastructure around schools and uh, the self-determination work around education and child welfare. All of this is the long-term work that we need to continue to reduce mental health crises and, and substance use crises in communities. On climate change, um, and I think it was Kevin, uh, you're absolutely right to be uh, worried about what the future holds in terms of uh, compounding crises related to climate change. It ties into the mental health conversation, by the way. Um, communities that are repeatedly experiencing threats or, in fact, disasters as a result of wildfires or flooding events, uh, climate change related events um, are struggling to keep up quite frankly and it's been some of the most challenging work that I've seen in my time in the last 10 months. What's really promising is the approach that our government is taking to try and to work more collaboratively and to insist on trilateral approaches with provinces, territories and indeed uh, First Nations communities. We can no longer um, rely on provinces and territories to solely manage these crises and tell communities what they must or must not do, what kinds of supports or services are available. It has to be done, uh, again, led by Indigenous people through Indigenous lenses. And my commitment to you on the federal department side is that we are working on much better, faster, and more respectful trusting processes so that you're not worried about money in the middle of a crisis. But I think it is a longer, longer Longer and larger conversation because uh, there are many crises going on all at once and I can't see a change to that or an alleviation of that as, uh, as we see the climate um, continue to heat up. So we're, we, we need to be thinking thoughtfully together about what we're going to do to protect communities and how we're going to address the long-term threat that climate change poses. And then finally on um, uh, to Ryan on, on, um, on uh, uh, the hospital and the intersection of provinces and territories with the delivery of health care. Look, this is appalling. It's an appalling situation that we see so much systemic racism still exist in health care systems across the country. In fact, it's the one of the reasons that I'm a federal politician. Uh, I certainly saw that day after day in my own home community of Thunder Bay, running a large homeless shelter with many Indigenous clients that could not get equity or kind or compassionate or any care in many cases. Basis. It's why we have the anti um, uh uh, the the uh, in ending in, um, anti-Indigenous racism in healthcare initiative. It's why we're proposing co-developed health legislation. It's why we want to ensure that First Nations people are at the table as provinces and territories reshape their provincial offerings. And it's why that we want to make sure that Indigenous communities have what they need um, to continue to provide care to the capacity that they feel they're capable of in their own communities. So we have a lot of work to do there. We're just at the beginning stages, but. I'm excited about the potential to transform healthcare delivery across the country. Thank you very much. So we will now hear the last three, sorry, with the last three speakers. So I'll go microphone two, one, two. Microphone two, Chief McBride, to you, please. Chief Arden McBride, the Minister of First Nation, Quebec. Bonjour, Madame la Ministre. J'aimerais avoir une réunion avec vous et votre bureau dans les. J'espère les semaines ou les mois qui suivent. The reason why I, I ask this in French is because one to show you that I'm bilingual. The second is we're having issues with uh, health because we are border communities. 
I am the last generation that's bilingual. I, I, I went to French school. The, the people behind are younger than me, I'll say. Uh, we changed over to English school uh, years ago. Our elders only speak English. When they go to get health, uh, health services, we have to go to Ontario, New Liskert, Ontario. The service providers are, are kind, they're good, but it's the province that's the issue in regards to payments, specialists. So when our elder has to go see a specialist, be it for eye, I'll, I'll use eye as an example. They may have to go one hour, two hour, the furthest if they get service in Ontario. But because these specialists are, are not paid what they're asking because the rates are different from Quebec, some of them have to go to Montreal, which is eight to 10 hours away. It doesn't make sense. There has to be dialogue with the province, the feds, about this health system that's not working for borderline uh, English-speaking communities. There are three Algonquin communities that are uh, mostly Anglophone, and these three Algonquin communities are having the same issues. I won't speak on their behalf, but I'll only speak on behalf of my community. We have to sit down, we have to talk, we have to have a serious dialogue on how we can fix this problem. And, and it, it, it's a shame that some of our elders have to go so far. Just a trip alone tires them out. Imagine going to see a specialist and you're already tired. That's gonna add to the diagnosis, depending on what it is that you have. Worse if it's cancer. So I would like to have a, a meeting in the very near future with you in your office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Microphone number one, please. Yes, uh, <coughs> Roger. Uh, my name is Mike Morris. I'm a proxy for uh, KI, but I'm uh, putting on my other hat. I'm a council member for Casablanca Lake First Nation. And uh, right now, uh, we have 16 trailers and uh, five homes to build, to put in place. And we only have uh, enough power to, uh, to hook up seven seven trailers and thank you for giving us uh, 50 million dollars to uh, to uh, renovate our uh, present school and uh, to build the high school but we can't hook them up when they get finished in 2023 so uh, i'm meeting with uh, hydro one uh, on monday monday afternoon and we're going to start the process for uh, temporary generation for uh, for our community and uh, they gave us a deadline of August 31 to get our act together so that we can have uh, a generator and everything else on the 2023 winter road. So we need your help to move the uh, process along. Uh, we don't have time to, uh, to uh, you know, battle it out with your uh, staff at Thunder Bay. We'd like to uh, meet with you or uh, wherever you appoint to uh, work with us to speed uh, what we need to do along. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the last speaker for this Q&A session, sorry for the others, the last speaker, microphone number two, and I'll then turn the floor over to, to the minister, and then we will invite our other guests. So thank you, microphone number two, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hantla and Jawa and Shkwesh, Lise Bahan Cook, Bivin Sletku, Lise Bahan Chief Quarter Band. Thank you for the time to, to speak. Um, just to remind you, Madam Chair, don't forget this is a Chief's Assembly. And I hope uh, the rest get to talk as well, too. Um, good to see you, uh, Minister. Last time we seen you was uh, February 24th when you did the, the flight with uh, the leadership in the Dikla Valley on the flood. I um, haven't heard very much after that. I'd like to... Um, get a firm commitment from you and your office to come meet with uh, myself and the Nicola Chiefs on uh, unresolved issues that uh, we still haven't heard back from Indigenous Services Canada. And we'd like to ha make sure that that happens really soon, not uh, five months down the line. So um, invitation and I was just speaking to my fellow chiefs here. It, it, it's going to snow because not too often we get three ministers in a row. So 
Just hold on. Good day, uh, Minister. After what we experienced here yesterday, hearing from our youth, and today hearing from, from our youth again, and, and parents of uh, children that have been lost in the system, and because of inaction and a lot of things happening, this has to do with the uh, agreement signed on June 30th, 2022, the um, compensation final agreement, um, compensation or the final settlement agreement, the FSA, and payments under that FSA. The FSA excludes payments to the estates of parents who experienced discrimination that would, that, and would be eligible under the tribunal orders. The estates of deceased parents are eligible for compensation under that tribunal. So there is some gaps in the system that we need to address. And I invite my friend here to... 40, sorry, 40 seconds left. 40 seconds. You have se 40 seconds. Minister Hadju, I act as proxy for my chief, Johnny Pierre. My name is Joni Conlon. I am a social worker in Northern British Columbia. I'm an Indigenous social worker. I chose this job because I wanted to help. And when we see that the system is incredibly failed, we got to talk about long-term reform, but we have to talk about compensation. For these families who sit up here and cry, I ask you to address this. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you to all of you that came to the microphone. Yes, and I now turn the floor over to final comments by Minister Aidu. To you, Minister. Well, thank, thank you very much, everybody. The theme of health comes up over and over, and the intersection with the provinces and territories comes up over and over, and it, it, it's unacceptable that you might get alternate levels of care depending on where you live. So, Chief McBride, we'll look into this particular issue and see what we can do about the rates of service. Um, but it is another argument for the co-developed health legislation that has to be a priority. And I'm looking to all of you to understand what that can um, do to transform communities, health delivery and health access. So let's keep doing that hard work together. Um, in terms of um, um, uh, Mike Morris uh, from Casablanca, um, I'm happy to help uh, with the conversation with Hydro One, and it's great news that you have new infrastructure, but we do need to figure out how it's going to be powered. So these kinds of things are um, really, it's really important that you engage my ministerial team. I think uh, Clint Cucci is here somewhere handing out business cards to people. He's at the back, so he has lots and lots of cards. If you've got specific infrastructure challenges or specific projects that are stuck, Please make sure you see Clint. He'll give you a card, and he is my uh, my. I don't want to say secret weapon; it's a little violent, but my special tool, if you will, to um, unlodge problems that exist at the at, at the department level. And finally, um, to Coldwater um, Creek or Coldwater Community, uh, I really want to thank you for that visit. It was very powerful. But we will um, we will plan a time to meet again to talk about the next steps. I'm hoping that that work has continued with the department. It certainly was my direction to work quickly and supportively on your goals and your agenda. I know that the province of BC has been meeting extensively with the federal government on the um, extensive flooding situation and the rebuild, uh, but if you're not getting the details and the information you need, then we have to do a better job. So I'm really, again, grateful for the time today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to continue this really important work with AFN. And thank you very much, everyone, for being here and for being such uh, incredible, passionate advocates for your communities. Um, Minister, uh, I just wanted everybody to know that I've known Patty uh, long before she was a minister, um, which is why I gave her a warm hug. And I really appreciate your work. You have come so long uh, a journey from uh, Thunder Bay to being the minister of this file. And so we wanted to give you a gift. We've been, I just wanted to share with everybody what the gift is. It's salmon, uh, which is medicine from the West Coast. So for you. Thank you very much, Francis. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Minister, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Cedric?